Alan, thank you for being here today. I'm pretty pumped I get to talk with you and kind of learn from you and, and, and hear about some of your experiences. I know that I do this as a way so that I can learn from people that are uh, performing at a high level in the basketball world. And so it's a, it's a pleasure for me to have you on here. So as we get started, do you mind just kind of sharing with our audience who you are, what you do, and, uh, and why you do what you do? Absolutely. Uh, I am actually a basketball performance coach. Um, I guess formally known as strength and conditioning coach, but I'm, I'm really big in the terminology and, and I've changed that title because uh, I really believe that, that what I do and what others in my field do uh, far exceeds just getting someone stronger and in better shape. Uh, I think performance is a more overarching title, which describes, you know, um, our attempt to approve, improve every facet of a player's game except for their skill work. Uh, so I don't do ball handling or shooting or passing drills. Um, but certainly aim to improve a basketball player's athleticism, uh, which my number one goal with that is, is to make sure players understand that athleticism is more than just running fast and jumping high. Uh, I know that's what everyone wants. Uh, those are the sexiest two traits. You know, there's not a, a player in America that doesn't want to dunk the basketball, and I get that. Uh, so we certainly offer drills and exercises and concepts to improve those. Uh, but if a player really wants to maximize their ability – uh, they have to be equally focused on their balance, uh, their hand-eye coordination, their reaction. Uh, they have to get in great basketball shape. Uh, they have to be able to stop on a dime and load and explode in another direction. Uh, and I'm a firm believer that by raising your basketball athleticism, then you raise the potential to perform your skills mm -hmm. at the highest level. And that's ultimately what a player is looking to do. Um, I actually turn 40 years old tomorrow, so I'm, I'm older than I look, hopefully. Uh, and I've been in this business about 20 years now um, and have seen a lot of monumental shifts and changes. And, and I'm very thankful to, to do what I do and, and always appreciate an opportunity to, to share with folks like your audience. Yeah, well, no, thank you so much. And so you mentioned there that you've been doing this for quite some time now. And so I, I want to kind of hit the rewind button now and go back to when you were getting started, when you had the vision for what you're doing right now, but you weren't quite there yet. Can you walk me through uh, maybe what it was like for you as you were getting started and maybe a a specific hard time that you encountered and what you did to overcome that hurdle? Sure. You know, basketball has been my number one passion ever since I was a kid. Uh, I mentioned that I'm, I'm just turning 40 and I actually have five and a half year old twin sons and uh, an almost four year old daughter. And, and I took one of my sons to his first basketball practice the other day. Uh, and it hit me that 35 years ago, I went to my very first basketball practice as a five year old kindergartner. Mm -hmm. And 35 years later, I'm still very attached and close to the game. Uh, and that's because I'm very passionate about the game of basketball. Um, as I got older, probably junior, senior year in high school, uh, I really started to have an affinity for the performance side um, to quote unquote lift weights and, and get faster. And, you know, I had the strength shoes and I had air alert and I had all the different vertical jump programs, uh, but I was really fascinated by just the performance side of things. Um, and then both of my parents were in elementary education for 30 years. Uh, so I was raised knowing the importance of being able to have a positive influence on young people. Uh, so the number one reason I got into this line of work was I figured out it was a way to combine my love for basketball with my love for performance work, with my uh, affinity for having an impact on young people. And, you know, I, I'm very, again, thankful and blessed that I've been able to make a living doing three things that I'm very passionate about uh, and three things that are very important to me. Uh, I will say that when I started, and this is in the late 90s, um, basketball performance training really wasn't a thing. Um, you know, uh, Michael Jordan was kind of doing some stuff, but it really wasn't highly publicized. Uh, in fact, in the late 90s, less than one third of NBA teams even had a strength and conditioning consultant. Uh, and that person was literally uh, the local bodybuilder at the nearest health club who kind of looked like he knew what he was talking about and would give some tips to some of the NBA assistant coaches. Uh, obviously, if you fast forward 20 years, you know, every NBA team now not only has a, a head strength and conditioning coach or performance coach, they have an entire staff dedicated to that. Mm -hmm. They have nutritionists, they have massage therapists, they have athletic trainers, strength and conditioning coaches, um, people that, I mean, it, it's amazing. They literally have an entire team of people designed for something that 20 years ago, no one was doing. Uh, so by far and away, the hardest part when I first started was convincing basketball players and coaches that this was something they needed um, because they could easily look at the best players and, you know, 
again, uh, with my age, I grew up watching Isaiah Thomas, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson. Of course, Michael Jordan was my idol. But, you know, of those guys, Magic wasn't doing any of this stuff. Bird wasn't doing any of this stuff. So it was a much harder sell to, to convince kids and, and coaches that if the best players in the world aren't really concerned with improving their basketball athleticism, why should they? Uh, and now what used to be a major roadblock is now the easiest sell in the world. Because if you look at LeBron, KD, Steph Curry, Kyrie, uh, CP, all of those guys uh, do this stuff on a year round basis. This is a major pillar to their development. And uh, since most kids look up to players in the NBA and inspire to play at that level, whether it's realistic or not, it just makes my job so much easier. So the initial hurdle of convincing players that they need to do this and stop just playing five on five and doing shooting drills uh, was definitely the hardest. Uh, but thankfully, over time, it's now the easiest. OK, that, OK, that, very cool. Very cool. cool. So that, 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 the way you over, way you over, simply time or the strategy that you had to help you overcome the time. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, again, when you're dealing with players, the most important part, and I know you know as a coach, is to get them to buy into what you're selling and to get them to understand the perceived relevance. You know, if you want a kid to give you their best effort and to have a high level of focus, they have to truly believe that what you're having them do is going to make them better. Uh, and in the skill world, it's usually an easy translation. You know, you show a shooting drill and a kid understands, okay, this is going to make me a better shooter. Shooting is one of the primary skills in basketball. Okay, I get it. Uh, it's a much harder sell when it comes to performance work that you've got to be able to explain to a kid, well, why is it important that I can stop on a dime and change direction? But why is it important that I'm in basketball shape, not cross country shape? You know, why is it important uh, that I have a, a, a good center of gravity and good balance? Why does that matter? Well, because every single skill in the game of basketball, especially the skill of shooting, drastically decreases when you're off balance. So learning how to get in and stay in a position of balance is extremely important. Uh, and again, you take a player like a Steph Curry or a Kevin Durant. Uh, these guys are, you know, you don't look at them and immediately think strength and conditioning because they're not big, powerful, imposing players like LeBron. Uh, but KD and Steph, uh, those guys, their athleticism is off the charts. It's just not as much on the strength and power side as it is, <clears throat> excuse me, on the quickness side, on the agility side, on the balance side. I mean, the thing Steph Curry is able to do with a basketball is, is mind boggling. And a lot of that has to do with his balance, uh, with his hand eye coordination, with his reaction, with his unbelievably quick release. You know, so all of these things have been building blocks in his game. Uh, which is why he's he's able to do what he can do. Absolutely, and absolutely. And this is not a question. This is not a question. Ahead of time, but I'll go. Ahead. Time, but I'll go ahead. Do you feel that the you feel that the, a, a, a good job of a good job of an overall overall factors balance coordination, or is it more kind of like uh you know like Katie at the combine couldn't put up the one eighty five and got a lot of flack for that? How do you assess where a player's at in terms of some of those things that aren't as sexy? You know, bench press those those big heavy weights and lifting measurements and how do you make sure that they're on the right track to developing those skills? Well, ultimately their performance on the court during five on five is the ultimate test. Mm -hmm. and, and I really believe that, you know, uh, strength conditioning performance, it's a means to an end. It's not an end itself. Nobody's paying KD money to bench press 185 pounds. No one. Mm -hmm. What they're paying him to do is to be able to play the game at the highest level against the best players in the world, uh, against constant contact. And as long as he can perform his skills against constant contact uh, without it having an adverse effect on his skills, then he is what I call basketball strong. Mm -hmm. And that's the terminology that I use with players. Uh, you need to be basketball strong. You need to be basketball fast. Uh, Usain Bolt is fast. There's no one that could argue that. Usain Bolt is not basketball fast. Unless Usain Bolt can sprint three meters, stop on a dime, plant and defensive slide to his left as quickly as possible, then he's not basketball fast. So getting a player to be able to bench press 185 10 times or get them to run the 100-meter dash right. uh, as fast as possible is really irrelevant. And, and I kind of use those as examples uh, to make sure that players understand the why behind what they're doing. Because, mm -hmm. uh, again, I cannot stress enough that that's what's most important, uh, that a player needs to understand the why in order for them to give you their best effort 
and to give you a high level of focus. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and so as, as you're giving those examples, you're talking about Kevin Durant, who I know that you've had a chance to work with and you're around a lot of high level players. Can you just shine a light on who the most impressive one has been and, and what's so impressive about them and what helps separate them from the rest of the pack? You know, I, I've had a chance to spend quality time with KD and I've spent quality time with Chris Paul and Stephen Curry at, at various events and things. Uh, and all three of those guys are as impressive of human beings as they are of basketball players. And all three of those guys uh, are legitimate gym rats. And, and I don't use that term very loosely because there's not many of them left. Uh, gym rats are a dying breed these days. But all three of those guys love being in the gym. Uh, if you took their celebrity and their fame and their money away from them tomorrow, I'm willing to bet you'd find Chris Paul, Stephen Curry, and Kevin Durant uh, out at a park somewhere in the next couple of days putting up shots because that's what they love to do. Um, and, and I think that's that's really important. Um, and while KD certainly had a, a tremendous work ethic in high school, uh, the funny part is uh, the two players that I look back on, uh, one of them was at my career when I was at Montrose Christian for seven years, uh, and another was at DeMatha, which I'm going in, I'm in my sixth year at DeMatha now. Uh, both of the players that I name as being just unrelenting workers are probably players not many people have heard of. Um, but those two guys maximize their ability to the fullest. And, and that's what's most impressive. Uh, at Montrose, there was a Japanese point guard named Tashi Ito, who was actually the point guard on KD's high school team. Uh, he ended up playing in, at Portland uh, University, and I believe he plays overseas in Japan now, um, and is arguably just one of the toughest, hardest working kids I've ever met. Uh, the one at DeMatha is actually the starting point guard at Pitt right now for Jamie Dixon. Uh, a, a young man named James uh, Robinson. Again, his leadership, his mental and physical toughness, his work ethic. I mean, those guys are unparalleled. And, and I like to bring those to light because while I want all kids to dream and I want kids to aspire to be the best they can be, uh, I'll give them a dose of reality that the chance of a kid listening to this right now being the next KD is very, very slim. Probably the same odds as whoever just won the Powerball jackpot. Uh, but the chance of a player being a Tashi Ito or a James Robinson is much, much higher. And I want players to focus on the things that they have control over, like their work ethic, like their toughness, uh, like their consistency, uh, like their ability to work smart. And that's really when, when I travel the world doing my cutting edge clinic series, that's what I want players to understand is they need to own the things that they can control be the best player that they're capable of being, and then just let the chips fall where they may. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a very freeing feeling too, as an athlete, knowing that you are able to have control over some things, apply your effort to it, and then you're able to, like you said, work smart and efficiently because you're not tied to the results of that. So then going forward, Alan, you've also had the chance to be around a lot of great coaches from your work through the, through the Hardwood Hustle podcast. Uh, can you just talk about some things that maybe maybe one or two coaches that stick out in your mind and then like two or three things that they do on a consistent basis, whether it be how they coach, how they treat people that help them stand out above the rest as well? Sure. And I've been, yeah, again, the thought that this basketball has taken me all over the world has allowed me to meet just some unbelievable people. I'm so blessed to have been around some amazing coaches. Uh, I'm around one in Mike Jones at the Matha all of the time. I mean, he, he's one of the best uh, coaches at any level that I've ever met, uh, but certainly one of the, the nation's top high school coaches. Uh, and there's a few themes that that I think resonate with all of them, uh, whether you're talking about Coach K uh, to, to Mike Jones. Uh, one, they have a, a deep caring for their players beyond the game of basketball, that, that they're there to help develop young men and help enable these, these players to achieve whatever it is that they're trying to achieve. You know, at, at Coach K's level, most of his players want to play in the NBA. Uh, at, at our level at DeMatha, all of our players want to play in college. So they have a deep caring uh, beyond just the, the basketball. And I, I think uh, when you when you have that caring and commitment and the players understand that, they're willing to do anything for you. They'll run through a wall for you. And I think that's important. Um, I also know that the best coaches uh, work relentlessly on their craft. They're never satisfied. They never feel like they've arrived, that they have all the answers, that they know. I mean, uh, and I'll say with full transparency, I'm a diehard Duke fan. I'm a Coach K fan. Uh, I know at the time of this recording, uh, Duke's lost three in a row, which hasn't happened since 2007. Um, but I have no doubt Coach K will right the ship and get them back uh, where they need to be. And you're talking about someone that's won gold medals, won five national championships, has more current players in the NBA than any other college coach, 
and he's never satisfied. He's never complacent. I can guarantee you that he will coach today at Duke as hard and as well as he's coached at any time in his his 30 plus year career. Uh, so having a a quest for for mastering their craft and then great coaches are always prepared. Uh, they're prepared for every practice. They're prepared for every game. Uh, they're prepared for every situation that could arise. Uh, you know, they, they have a, a game plan that they want to, you know, that they want to execute. Uh, but they realize quickly that if, if something changes, a player gets a couple fouls, if somebody's injured, if someone on the other team is, is hot that you weren't expecting, that they can make adjustments. Uh, and I think those three traits uh, certainly, you know, uh, kind of transcend great coaches and not even of just basketball. You know, I spent Basketball is my number one passion, uh, but you better believe that I really study and learn from great coaches of all sports. Uh, I remember last summer I was working at the uh, Jay Billis camp, somebody I have just renowned respect for. And at his camp in Charlotte, uh, there's a swim center there and there's a coach who was working with, uh, if I'm saying his name right, Ryan Lochte, uh, you know, one of the world renowned swimmers in addition to Michael Phelps. Uh, and the guy that was his swim coach uh, has worked with, you know, dozens of Olympians. And I had a chance to sit down with this guy for about 30 minutes and he just blew me away. I mean, all of the stuff that he does and he's talking about with swimmers is the same type of stuff that a Mike Jones or a, a coach K does with their players. So I, I don't think as coaches and as trainers uh, and as educators, we should ever limit ourselves to our own field. I think it's really important. We le you know, learn from anybody uh, that takes the time to master their craft. Yeah, no, thank you. And so, just a few more questions here, and then I know that you have to run. One of the commonalities yeah. that was uh, in both the players and the coaches that you referred to was that lack of satisfaction, that constant desire to get better. Where does that come from? Is that something that some people are just wired that way, or is that developed or sparked over time? I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, I definitely believe that some folks are born with kind of that killer instinct, that that relentless attitude to always get better. And, and as, you know, uh, as we all grow older and we, we see great players like Kobe and LeBron, and it's inevitable that everybody makes the comparison with Michael Jordan, who, who I, I would say at this point in time, most people agree that Michael Jordan's the best player to ever play. But obviously, uh, you know, now those lines are getting a little blurred when you have a Kobe, you have a LeBron. I mean, for the love of God, if, if Steph keeps up what he's doing right now for several years on end, uh, he's going to be in the conversation. Uh, but I think the interesting part is the one thing that everyone always goes back to with MJ is he just had this it factor. Mm -hmm. He had this killer instinct, this, this will to win, this will to do anything. Um, and I do think at that level, some of that is innate. It's in his DNA. He was born with that. Um, but no, I actually think uh, preparedness, uh, mental and physical toughness, uh, competitiveness, are very much learned characteristics that that you can teach players and you can condition them to get better at. Um, and it, it's certainly something, you know, that, that we try and work on with with our players at DeMatha and that I try and instill with players uh, when I do my cutting edge clinics. But no, these are characteristics you don't have to be born with. You can get better. I would say the same for leadership. Uh, you know, um, it's very interesting. I told you that I have twin sons. Uh, they're fraternal, so they don't necessarily look the same. Uh, they have very different personalities and temperaments and the younger smaller of the twin boys has some type of inherent leadership whenever they're playing games or they're doing anything the younger smaller one is always the leader he's always the one that calls the shots he says this is the game we're going to play and these are the rules i volunteer at their kindergarten class once a week he does the same thing in kindergarten and you're talking about a five-year-old who somehow has already developed uh, the initial traits of being a leader. Um, so he was born with that in some way, shape or form. I've certainly not, you know, had my five-year-old go through any type of formal leadership instruction. Um, but I still believe that he, as well as my other son and my daughter can learn leadership uh, if I teach them properly and, and subject them to, to good resources. But but some of it they're born with, but the rest is absolutely something they can acquire. Oh, very good. No, so then for so the player or further culture, further build. You said resources? Yes, yeah, well, it, funny enough, so my, my podcast co-host and very good friend Adam Bradley uh, has recently uh, launched something called Lead em Up, which is a, a structured curriculum that uses something called game dynamics from another friend of mine named Steve Shinbaum, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, from a company called Game On that basically 
teaches leadership and teaches character development, which is something all coaches talk about, but very few actually put into practice and teach. Uh, I'm a big believer that that leadership, that character, that your program's culture, these things have to be intentional and they have to be purposeful. They can't be things that you just leave to chance. You can't just say, well, you know, you're our best player. I hope you're our leader. No, that's unacceptable. You have to teach young people how to lead. You have to teach people what it means to have high character. Uh, you know, you have to teach your team and your program uh, with purpose the culture that you want them to have. So uh, Lead Em Up is a tremendous resource. Um, and then as you can see, I'm, I'm wearing a Pure Sweat uh, t-shirt, which as of about a week ago, um, I formally joined Drew Hanlon and Pure Sweat, uh, kind of the, the stronger team name and brand's not really going away, but it's all falling under the umbrella of Pure Sweat um, because I, I really believe that uh, I can team up with Drew, who, who is a master at doing the skill work and the, the strategic X's and O's, um, and, and together him and I uh, can really help uh, guys like yourself raise the standard for education for coaches, players, and trainers. Um, so I, I would say lead them up, uh, better basketball, uh, the hardwood hustle and pure sweat, uh, and PGC basketball are four or five tremendous resources. Uh, yes, I'm fully biased because I'm involved with all of those, but I only get involved with people that I believe in, people that I trust, and people that I think are moving the game forward. Um, so uh, where it may sound like a, a shameless plug, I only plug those things because I believe in them with all my heart. And I put a lot of time and effort uh, into to helping those resources. Uh, and that's something that I'm very proud of. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you for sharing those. So before we say goodbye, Alan, if you just want to quickly toss out uh, what, what you're currently involved in, how we can follow you and connect with you and take advantage of the things that you are sharing, and then we'll go ahead and say goodbye. Uh, sure. It, well, now that we're, we're actually working on launching a, a revamped Pure Sweat website, uh, and Drew and I are going to be merging social accounts. So I've worked really hard, as Drew has, uh, into building up you know, a very solid and loyal uh, social followings. And anyone listening to this that, that follows either of us uh, on any of the social platforms, we really and truly appreciate that. Um, but we decided that we want to combine um, and, and hopefully make our social outreach even more powerful. And, and kind of the concept of team behind basketball, uh, we believe that uh, us kind of combining and pooling our resources and having a very narrow focus of trying to help enable uh, and empower coaches and trainers and players that in, instead of one plus one equaling two, uh, Drew and I are hoping that one plus one can equal five and, and that we can really, uh, again, pull our resources and our connections to share some tremendous information help grow the game. Uh, anyone listening or following, uh, you can follow at any of the at Pure Sweat handles, uh, YouTube and all of that. Um, and, and we're here to serve. You know, if you're a trainer or you're a coach listening, uh, if there's anything that we can do to help you, again, uh, to raise your coaching game or training game, or if you are a player uh, and there's anything we can do to literally raise your game, it'd be our honor to do it. That's why we do this. We're here to serve and, and we appreciate platforms such as this. Uh, John, I really appreciate the opportunity to be on this morning. This has been this has been great, um, and I'm definitely open to doing this again in the future when I have a little bit more time. For I it. really appreciate you being on here, Alan, sharing with with me and my audience. And I'll uh, again, I'll send this over to you so you have to share as well. Thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you. You guys have a great sure, day. Take care.